All right, good morning, LA Comic Con. expert Dick Wallace and I'll be your moderator this morning so you love it I love it it's X-Men the animated series and it's the 30th anniversary so let's talk about a fantastic panel he developed X-Men the animated series he served as showrunner and he's the author of the fantastic book previously on X-Men and the co-author of the art and making of X-Men the animated series Eric Lee Wall He wrote the episodes Days of Future Past Part 1 and Whatever It Takes, and co-wrote the art and making of X-Men the Animated Series, Julia Lee Wall. <laughs> Not only did he serve as a producer and art director on the show, but he directed all 76 episodes, Larry Houston. <laughs> Now this next panelist needs no introduction. Does she, Sugar? <laughs> She's the voice of Rogue, Lenore Zahn. <laughs> and he wrote many classic episodes, including Captive Hearts and A Rogue's Tale, Bob Skrr. So, in honor of the show's 30th anniversary, we thought today we'd talk a lot about the development of the show, how it got off the ground, its premiere in season one. We are going to get right into it. So, Eric, uh, can you tell us about getting the green light on the series and the extremely quick turnaround for season one? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it was a it was Sunday night. We're, we're at home. You get the call. You're going to be doing X-Pen. I said, well, that's a Marvel book, right? And so that's my, my background with the X-Men. <laughs> Luckily, Larry knew them backwards and forwards. Bob knew them backwards and forwards, so I had a few people to ask questions of. But, uh, but the quick turnaround was that Margaret Lesh, this wonderful woman that made this all possible, who had just been made the head of Fox Kids, who tried for 10 years to get the show on the air with no interest from anybody else in town, she got it going. And she said, well, you know, I know, X I know Batman's been in development for a whole year, but can you still catch up? We've got seven months until September. Well, something was February. So she said, just write as fast as you can, draw as fast as you can. We'll try to get 13 episodes up and running for people and pray that it, it, it works out. So we started like three months behind, and that, or certainly like a year behind Batman. And there was a certain energy to that. You know, we just, there's no like second uh, thinking things through, well, maybe we can do something different. Just first stories we got, done. Larry, Larry <laughs> first, thing. First, Im first images that come to your mind, draw them off, yeah. off of the animators in Korea. Yeah. So it was a absolute dive in the deep end, cross our fingers, hope, pray that it gets done, that, that it turns out, and it ended up being the most amazing show any of us had ever worked on. How that all came together is a mystery, but it really was. Uh, Larry's worked on 95 shows, Julie and I have worked on 50. Nothing came together like this creatively. And there were a lot of, a lot of fights early on. People said, it, it's not gonna work, it needs to be younger, it needs to dumb it down, take the big words out, make it more for six-year-olds. And all of us agreed that that was terrible, it would ruin the show, and so, there's a lot of fighting that first year. We hold it together and get it done and as fast as we could. And then once it came out and was it, then you guys all made it a hit. Um, everybody was happy with it. So <laughs> no more. No more <laughs> okay, so Larry, what were your first design responsibilities when you came on the show? And did you have any trepidation about the job since it was already so behind schedule? <laughs> uh, believe it or not, I had I had what we get, what we will say between ourselves. I've done a lot of what they call uh, triage <laughs> directing, where I have to take something that's like you know a month or two behind and jump in and deep water and get production in 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 um, back on schedule. No, with the X Men, it's something I had was involved with Margaret Lesh when we did the first uh, prior to the X Men. I was one of the three co-directors of that, and so. As far as the, the designs and drawing and stuff, I was on board way a long time ago with Margaret about doing the X-Men. 
she really tried to get it on the air. But it didn't work. The zeitgeist just wasn't there. And so fast forward about six years later, when she became the, the CEO of uh, Fox Kids, that's when she called me and Eric and, and, and uh, Rick Holberg and Will Mineo and, and others, and we put together this version of the show that you guys uh, saw that first, that first season. Um, as far as the duties of being an art director, the three of us in the beginning were all designing the characters. Uh, Will and Rick and myself, we were designing that initial set, uh, you know, uh, Professor X and the Jubilee and the whole nine yards. And the three of us were all old fanboys. I mean, we, we had directing skills, but we were fanboys. And so we were like gung ho. I mean, we really wanted to do the show and do it the right way and add the blacks so it looked like the comic books and everything. So we were, we were ready and willing and, and we wanted to do an accurate version of the comic books. Put, take the books, put it on the air. You know, that was our model. That's what we wanted to do. And um, we, luckily, we, we were successful at it. But man, like, he, like Eric was saying, we had so many, there were so many speed bumps, I call them, along the way but that almost derailed the entire series. We, you know, we stuck it out and stuck our guns and got the version out that you guys saw. And I have to thank all you guys because Without you guys keeping the ratings at the very top, it's either us or Power Rangers, we got to pick up the season two. <laughs> so I want to thank you guys. Yeah. 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 Okay, here is this one's for you. So uh, you wrote the first part of Days of Future Past, uh, which is the only season one story that is heavily adapted from the comics. Uh, did you find adapting with existing source material helpful or a hindrance? Taking the Wayback Machine to 1992, and there was no internet, and there was no way to Google this stuff, it, it, and X-Men was already, the train had left the station. So Bob was the one who knew the book's chapter and verse, and he wrote part two of Days of Future Past. But we were never in the same writer's room. There was no writer's room. I was working off of a dining room table, you know, the, because it was such a shoestring budget. Uh, we, there wasn't much going back and forth. It was more the arrogance of ignorance that we were given this crown jewel. I was given a chance to work on this crown jewel. But you can't use Kitty Pride. And they're not going to use the mental thing to go back, they're going to send someone back. It's like, what? Well, OK. But, and when they first asked us to work on it, they didn't know if they were going to approve the adaptation of it. So it was called uh, Future Tense as sort of a placeholder until Marvel, oh, OK, close, close enough. <laughs> <laughs> Off we ran. Great. Do you, mind if I, do you mind if I add to that? Um, I got the call from Eric saying we want to do Days of Future Past, but we want to do it with Bishop instead of Kitty Pride. And I'm like, oh my God, that's brilliant. <laughs> because Bishop was kind of new to the book, and in every issue, they go, uh, you'd be like, you know, Bishop, you'd be like, I hate Gambit. I'm going to kill Gambit because uh, he's, uh, well, I'll tell you next issue. <laughs> and they never got around to telling it. They just kept teasing it. And I'm like, this is a really great chance to tie up something the comics aren't tying up. And so, uh, you know, we, so when Eric, when Eric asked me about doing Bishop, I'm like, this is, the, this is fantastic. And so uh, it wound up being a really, really great opportunity to take an existing story, an existing classic, and to put just enough of a new spin on it mm -hmm. to make it serve the books. So, so yeah, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so our next question is for you. Um, how did you first hear about X-Men casting voice actors? Uh, and can you tell us your first memories of recording as Rogue? Well, sugar, uh, my, my, my first uh, hearing about the show was from my Canadian Toronto agent who said, Lenore, um, you know, they're doing this cartoon series. It doesn't have a title yet. It's just, con they're calling it like a Project X, like it's a secret <laughs> project. And you, you got to go down and audition because they want a woman with a, a low sexy husky voice who can do a southern accent and I had played southerners on movies and television a few times at that point in time but I had also just gotten back to Toronto from New York where I'd been doing a play for boy I did I did a play for about three years in Chicago New York Mexico City 
Winnipeg, Toronto, like I, I've been on this long run of a play. And I said, well, you know, I don't know if I'm really interested in doing cartoons. I'm a serious actress, you know, I don't want to tell in the theater, you know, that's, that was the attitude at the time. So I didn't, I didn't go to the auditions. But a few months later, my agent called me again and she said, yes. Lenore, would you please get over to these auditions? They're having callbacks and they still haven't found the right actor for the part because it's you. <laughs> so I went down and I saw a picture of Rogue from a cell just standing there, you know, with, with her hand on her hip and the attitude. And I went, oh yeah. I can do that. <laughs> and, uh, and then I walked in the booth and I said, my daddy liked to kill himself when he found out I was a mutant. That was, I think, my first line. And then it was a little tiny monologue of, um, I remember I had me a boyfriend when I was 13. Had me a boyfriend till I kissed him. Poor boy went into a coma for three days. That was the next part. And I heard these guys in the L.A. booth, yeah. you know, miles away, going screaming yes. and going, "That's the voice!" <laughs> <don't laughs> and that was oh, yeah. it. That was how it started. Oh yeah, we, we were all listening to her. We had heard all these different tryouts, and when we heard her in unison, we were all going, "Oh my God! Don't let her leave the studio!" Sign <laughs> 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 <Right> up now. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know what it is, but but Larry oftentimes calls our show. The success and everything that went into it, lightning in a bottle. And that, I'd say that was yeah. a moment that day. So yes. thank you all. And I'm so grateful to you. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the series premiere, which is Night of the Sentinels. Uh, why did you choose to use the Sentinels in the first episode instead of Magneto, who is the X-Men's most famous villain? This is this is a this is a big deal. <laughs> well, we, we owe we owe our dear friend Will Mimeo, who we worked with Larry for what, thirty years, yes, and was a major part in setting the tone and the focus and everything creative about this show. We owe him. There there were two reasons that we stuck with the Sentinels. One was he understood <coughs> that they were a, an image of humanity, uh, distrust of mutants, and that's where we all wanted to focus. There are a bunch of the books where it's just super massive being battling other super massive being at the WWE. You know? So there are a lot of books. I mean, that's fun, and you're a kid, you enjoy reading those. But there are other sections of the books over the 30 years we had to pick from that was much more about how do you live as a mutant in this larger <laughs> society that doesn't quite understand you and, and is afraid of you. And the Sentinels were the perfect incarnation of that. He chose them because he, th there was a story he really liked about, about learning the X-Men through the eyes of a new recruit, a young new recruit, which I agree with Mark Edens, who was <coughs> the pilot, and I agreed with completely. So the Sentinels were, were crucial for that, to set the tone for the series. There is a bit of a, 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 a story. There was someone at Marvel a, an, an executive who I never met, but after we'd finished setting up this world, we just killed ourselves for about a month, set up the world, finished the first script, and we got this eight-page memo saying, oh, you guys got completely wrong. Magneto's more important than, than the Sentinels. <coughs> Throw all this stuff out, start from scratch. You know, some of your characters are okay, but basically you screwed it, so do this over, please. And it wasn't, it wasn't our main guy at Marvel, so I said, why is this guy writing us an eight-page memo? And does he have the power to shut us down? Because we got it on a Friday, and there were no, no cell phones, no internet. We were faxing angrily at each other. <laughs> yeah. And we thought, is, is the show over? Has someone in Marvel decided that, no, we can do something completely different? And luckily, our buddy Will well, well, yeah. knew, not only knew the books better than this guy did, but he had 20 years in animation and knew that our story fit animation perfectly, and that's why we chose the Sentinels to, to be the ongoing threat in the first season. We, we, we introduced Magneto in episode three. Uh, you know, that was real quick, because he's important. But that was the Sentinels were crucial to start the story with. 
Do you mind if I add to that a little bit? Sure. Um, I was kind of of a mind, because that's how it was in the book, that Magneto happens first and he triggers, he's the reason that the, the Sentinels are, are built. And so I was like, well, it should be Magneto first. And, uh, and Eric, I think, is, you know, he, his counterintuitive approach was exactly right. Because, um, you know, whereas Magneto is the most famous uh, a threat to the X-Men, uh, he is by no means their biggest threat. The biggest threat of all their villains, of Apocalypse and whoever else, their biggest threat is bigotry. The fact that they're in a world that hates and fears them. And the reason they're such in, um, incredible heroes, and they're enduring, they're, they are sworn to protect a world that hates and fears them. Yeah. So, so entering with uh, the prejudice and entering with the, the Sentinels was counterintuitive, and it was brilliant. It was exactly right. It's one of the reasons that I think Eric was perfect <clears throat> to spearhead the series because, you know, I've been reading the books ever since Giant Size X Men number one, and I was beholden to all the stories because the stories weren't stories; they were history. And Eric wasn't invested that way, so coming in with the objectivity that he did gave him the power to make this series its own thing and bring in a brand new audience for whom it was all very fresh, which I'm sure pretty much everybody here knew was the case. So um, I'm really grateful that they picked Eric and that they didn't get, you know, like a Mr. Fanboy like me who'd be so beholden to the books. So, uh, so, so bravo to Fox and, and bravo to Eric. And uh, Margaret Lesh, when she was spearheading the series, you know, there were people over her. She didn't run everything. She had bosses, and they were not sure about this X Men cartoon. And what she said was, "I believe in this to the degree where, if this is not a hit, I will leave." Their response was fantastic. We will show you the door. <laughs> so she she invested everything. She bet she bet the farm on the series, and God bless her. Yeah. So one final question about the show's launch. So uh, you premiered on Halloween 1992 oh, in prime yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, and then followed up with the second episode a week later. But the show didn't actually start airing on Saturday mornings until the following January. Yes. When did you know the show was a massive success? January. <laughs> we, we, we knew people liked it from the first couple sneak previews. There was also another sneak preview in, uh, uh, in Thanksgiving. Uh, just uh, again, the same episode, the same episode. And to answer for it, we, we bumped into a fan who was angry because he said, Well, then it came on in, in January and it was the same episode again. <laughs> right, right. But uh, we, we knew it got big numbers the first week, and by the third week, it was the biggest show on Saturday morning by a big margin. And so we went, All right. <laughs> you know, yeah. we did. Because we'd had all this struggle to keep it a certain way, and we kept being told that that's way too adult, it's way too dark, it's too challenging. The kids won't be able to follow all these characters. But no, the kids followed all the characters, and they loved it. So it all paid off, and we got no pushback for the next four years. <laughs> yeah. Now, for me, it was like when I I knew it, I knew the show had ratings, but I didn't know if people liked the show. And it wasn't until Julia went to Fox to ask them, "Do they like the show?" And she gave she came up with the story about no, go ahead. oh that she went to I think uh, uh, the I can't remember the girl's name but yeah, yeah. Charlotte Charlotte Charlotte, 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 Charlotte. 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 She asked her, is there any fan mail? Does people do people like the show? And she told Julia, come come to the hallway. So she went to the hallway. And you know, like when you get too much mail, the people, the mailman puts it into look this container. Well, she had a container full of postcards, and letters, stacked here to the ceiling, far back as you can on both sides of the, of the aisle, of the, of the corridor. And we, I had never seen any of it. Because if we had, we had seen it, we would have answered some of it. <laughs> but that's when I found out that there was a real good audience and we were touching a lot of lives. A lot of kids' lives, they enjoyed the show. That's when I found out people liked the show, for me. Great, all right, so we are now going to- Can I just add oh, one yes, really little quick thing? The actors in the show, because uh, the main team, we were all in Toronto, in Canada, 
We never heard about how successful the show was. We didn't hear the story about the mail. We never got any of that fan mail, which was directed to a lot of us as well. And we would have answered it. We didn't find out until a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we found out we went to a comic con. <laughs> they weren't told because they would have asked for races. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. So uh, now we're going to move on from season one into season two um, and do a special discussion on the episode A Rogue's Tale because not only do we have Lenora, the voice of Rogue, but we have Bob who wrote the episode. So uh, Bob, I'm going to start with you. Uh, this episode seems to pull a lot of elements from Avengers Annual number 10, which is Rogue's first appearance, and also Uncanny X-Men number 269, uh, which is the issue where Rogue's mind is being taken over by Carol Danvers. Uh, as a big X-Men fan, did you go back and reread any issues before writing this, or was this all just stuff pulled from memory? Um, this was all stuff pulled from my DNA. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the day, I remember the place, I remember everything about when I got um, Avengers Annual Number 10. I mean, it was one of my favorite books, it was my favorite introductions to a character. And I always loved Rogue because, okay, this is going to be hard to believe, go back and look at the letters pages. When Chris Claremont announced that Rogue was going to be joining the X-Men, all the letters said, if you put her in this book, I will stop buying it. <laughs> <laughs> because she was, she was such, a, she was such a, a vile character when you first meet her. And I, I loved her because, I mean, she's, uh, she's so conflicted. I mean, she and Wolverine, you know? Um, the thing about her is, she's a very visceral person. She's a very physical person. She's a very passionate person. And she can't have physical contact with anybody. That's a tragic character. And um, you know, my goal, my goal with uh, the, the episode was um, there were things uh, in the series that, that we had done that were at variance to the comics. I mean, there was a scene where she's standing next to Mystique, and they don't even you know sort of acknowledge each other. And I'm thinking, okay, um, I want to do an episode where at the very end of it. Rogue is exactly the same person in our series as she is in the comics. And so I wanted to reconcile all of that, and I figured the best way to do that is to tell the origin story that Chris Claremont had hinted at, but never actually told. And I figured this is a chance to tell a story that uh, has the potential to be really, really powerful. So um, um, we, we did an episode, and you know, God bless everybody who was uh, completely supporting this, that, uh, that I think is a really, it's, it's, it touches on a lot of amazing themes, and it doesn't do so in any hand, heavy hand. I want to throw some light on somebody else who was extremely instrumental in this series, uh, an executive named Sidney Wanter, who um, did another series called um, Batman, the animated series. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, was, he was so passionate about making sure that this series was, you know, filled with angst and filled with character, and, you know, that, this was going to be a serious-minded show with serious themes. And uh, he approached Batman with the same seriousness, although from very different angles. And uh, so, you know, when you hear about the, the, the myth of, you know, the network doesn't understand it, the network doesn't get it, oh, those executives. I oh, know, Sydney, Sydney was on top of this, and he was a guy he liked, and he's one of the fundamental reasons on why the series, and he fought the fights, man. He fought the good fights. So, um, so thank God for him, and uh, and I'm really again just really grateful to have the opportunity to tell the um, the Rogue story because I couldn't get to write the Wolverine episode <laughs> <laughs> because I recommended the guy who created Wolverine to write for the series, so he got the chance to write that episode <laughs> because I recommended him for the show. <laughs> no good deed ever goes on. <laughs> so, so for my sins, I was forced to write this Rogue. <laughs> so, Thank you, Sugar. So, Lenore, do you remember your reaction after you read the script for this episode for the first time? Um, well, I think every actor loves it when they get a script that's about their character. <laughs> you know, I have to say, it was nice. I think it's in the second season. And uh, so it was like, oh, great. Finally, we get a chance to really dig in and find out who Rogue is, who she was you know, her origin story, what makes her who she is. And I could relate to it because being um, a little girl from Australia, from Sydney, Australia, who was an only child who moved to Canada with my parents when I was eight, and I had this funny Australian accent to start with uh, that the Canadian kids couldn't really understand. 
Um, and then moving from like the western part of Canada, Regina, Saskatchewan, to Nova Scotia on the east coast, and changing schools a number of times, um, I always felt different. <laughs> and within the last name that starts with Z or Z, as you say here, mm -hmm. you know, it was like I was always at the end, always in the the back rows, always like. All these other kids in my classes had names like McDonald and McGuinness and all this, you know, normal sounding names. And I was the only Zed ever. Um, and so when I got to Roke, I did a lot of traveling around too as a young woman in my early 20s. I really was searching for myself. And so I felt Rogue searching for herself and trying to find out where she belonged and, and who her for want of a better word, who her tribe was, you know, where, who would accept her and where she would feel she could be herself and be her authentic self without fear, you know, because especially after her dad kicks her out of home and says, you know, you're not, you're not my child. Um, so for me, that was all so much beautiful angst. And I was able to really dig in and do a, a performance that I felt proud of. And, you know, and the stuff with Carol Danvers as well, you know, and the, and the, the mental anguish of trying to, to wrestle with a, a different personality that's stuck in your head. Um, I've had female impersonator friends who tell me, you try living with 26 different women inside of you. So, you know, I, was, I, I could, I got it. <laughs> And were you uh, surprised at how many times you have to scream in this script? <laughs> and did you ever hurt your voice? <laughs> no, because I'd already been, I was kind of a scream queen in Canada. <laughs> we did a lot of horror movies at that time. So in the 80s, I did a lot of features where I was screaming a lot, usually in my underwear. <laughs> you know, getting murdered in various ways, because that's what they do to young women in their 20s in the horror films. <laughs> At least I didn't have to be naked in this one. <laughs> Come on, my attic. Uh, he really hit it out of the park in that episode. Um, although we didn't do a very good betting process, let's face it. I mean, we get an Australian actor to play an X Men. <laughs> never happened again, thank God. <laughs> You're right. Okay, so now we have a very special treat for you guys. Uh, we pulled some X Men fan communities for the top five road lines. And Lador is going to read these out. I'll lighten up, sugar. That's the first one. Do you remember that one? Lighten up, sugar. I love that one. Um, oh, yes. I could spit on him if I wasn't a lady. <laughs> My daddy always said two's company and three's an eavesdropper. <laughs> you gonna shut up? Or am I gonna have to help you? <laughs> and my favorite, my you favorite. look as nervous as a long tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. <laughs> you can see it from where you're, you're sitting, but half of you now belong with it. <laughs> it's funny, you know, sometimes when I, when I start to talk to fans when they come to the table, I don't know if anybody's here today who. This happened yesterday, but suddenly they get kind of overcome and verklempt, and they, it's almost like they're about to, to faint, and, so, and they get very teary-eyed. Okay, it happened to you, it happened to, oh yes, oh yes, and that's right. Um, one time I was on a boat, um, on, like on a ferry, and these, these young girls came up to me and they said that they knew who I was, and they said that their friend was with them, this guy, and he loved Rogue, and loved the X-Men, would you please, talk to him as Rogue and, and surprise him, and, and I did, and this guy fainted. <laughs> I don't even have to touch them. <laughs> I leave you with good memories when you're kids. I, that's my main, my main goal in life. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we are now going to open up the floor to fan questions. So if anyone has a question, please just line up right here in the middle um, and 
Well, there's no microphone, so when you ask your question, please project. And we do have to ask a huge favor. Uh, no one is more excited about it, about X-Men 97 than me, but we cannot answer any, ask or answer any questions about it. It's all under wraps, so please keep your questions to the original animated series. Uh, we can tell you that none of us are actually, well, uh, we have some consultants up here, but, but none of us who work in the original series were uh, invited to, to write for it. Just put that out there. <laughs> ready? You ready? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. so first is uh, just a comment. The Scream Queen thing makes a lot of sense now, because I remember the episode when Rogue absorbed Juggernaut's power, and that scream is still kind of <laughs> echoing 30 years into the future. Oh my God. Then the other one's a question for everybody here. Of the entire series, for each of you, who is your favorite X-Men villain? Mm. Okay. Well, uh, so many, we, had to, we had to love them all when we were writing them. Um, <laughs> I, I think my, my favorite villain voice is Apocalypse, and yes. which yeah. John Holocaust created, which he was the very first Klingon, which we didn't know when we were writing for him. <laughs> it just breaks our nerd hearts that we didn't know we were writing for uh, Commander Kor. <laughs> um, but uh, his voice and Magneto's character, his relationship with Xavier, is my favorite relationship in the whole series. Just Xavier and Charles, like I know them, but Xavier and Charles, Xavier and Magneto, uh, that that complete uh, commitment to to their particular angle of looking at things, but their genuine affection for each other, but also friends of humanity are scary. They, there is no major like one bad guy friends of humanity. They're just these clusters that show up and do damage. Those those terrify me. Yeah. I'm on the same camp with uh, Eric. It's um, you know, Apocalypse and Magneto <laughs> together are like the best bad guys that X Men can face. But also, like in the one in the episode, she's talking about the Friends of Humanity. I'm not sure which writer wrote it, but you know, the guy who was ahead of the he Friends of Humanity was actually the son of uh, Saber Truth and Mystique. Mystique yeah. And um, there's one scene where he's talked. Jubilee is tied up, and she asks him. Why do you hate us? You know, we've not done, done, done nothing to you. And he turns to him and says, because you were born. Yeah. That line, like, when I read it in the script, it's like, ooh, well, that's strong. I, I think that was from Michael Edens, and we talked about it, kind of like, there's a great movie of Man in the Last Booth, where there's a tortured person that, that they're indicting the Nazis, and the person's actually, who's standing there pretending to be a Nazi general, projecting his evil is actually Jewish. I mean, it's like it's torturing him. So we just wanted to, yeah, that, that, yeah, I, I think my is capable of that because yeah. he was born. That was, that was strong. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for asking questions. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, my God. Sorry. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why we made the question last year. But, that, but the, the, the villains that I like the most are the ones who have the most of a, a great rationale for, for their feelings. So you, know, you can't get past Magneto. He used to, when they, when they first introduced him, he was the head of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. And I always thought, why would he have evil in yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the Brotherhood of Mutants because you know he's fighting for his people. It's where he's gonna make sure that his people are, are, are gonna thrive by any means necessary. And so you have this, uh, and also I love Callisto because she was a leader and she was looking after her people the same way. Um, my, my favorite villain, and I, I, it doesn't even classify as a villain, it, it's all the, the inner turmoil that the characters have. It's all the, you know, it's, it's, it's having to overcome the fact that you can't have physical intimacy despite the fact that you're a visceral person. It's all the stuff Wolverine is dealing with. By the way, um, uh, Margaret Lash, who championed the series, um, her favorite character, was Wolverine, <laughs> and it was because he was so he had so much inner conflict. And to me, um, you know, more than the villains they fight, that's all. It's like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You know, the the, the, the monster du jour is well, that's all interesting and fun. But it's really about the relationships and the fact that these characters are people. And that's the reason you're all here is because the characters aren't superheroes with powers; they're people with conflicts and. 
it makes them it makes them so powerful. That's why people have continued to respond to these characters. So, well, you have a question? Thank you. Um, yeah, first of all, big fan of the show. Loved it. Was not alive in 92. Did watch it, though. Um, and my question is that you, this is definitely, I think, the most expansive adaptation of the X-Men that we've ever gotten in terms of you getting all the stories that you guys got to cover and all the characters you got to bring in in the different episodes. Is there a story or a specific character that you never got to deal with or work in that you wanted to? Arcade. 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 Yes. Arcade. <laughs> I, I, I didn't have a story, but there was a, we did an episode where Cyclops discovers his father, okay, and they have this huge father-son conflict. And the only small part of that that I wish we had got to do is, is, is him discovering his other brother that he's in, in I think, x and so That's the only little, it's not a story, it's just a little sidebar. That's the only thing I wish we had done. So. I'm good. <laughs> That's everything. <laughs> In the comics, they used to not just fight other mutants, they used to fight other, you know, villains. And so occasionally they'd be fighting people like Doctor Doom. And I would love to have brought in some other <laughs> Marvel characters for them to fight. Um, although, you know, those were all beholden to other properties. But it would have been really boss to have them fight Doctor Doom and go to Liberia and maybe, maybe help a mutant thing. That would, that would have been a lot more contracts. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, might I say, um, Back in the day, you know, 92, uh, I was two years old. So I didn't get to the show until a little later. But, uh, you know, that was a perfect era of, for the kids who had TV but couldn't afford the books. You know, that, mm. that, was, that was an excellent time for amazing stories, for great, expansive backgrounds for characters that relate to you. You know, heroes with problems. You never think about that till you see it, read it. You know, so it was amazing. Uh, but my question is, um, were there ever moments... You know, it's, it's a little bit during this time that Stan Lee ever came to you guys and told you, I would love for this to be in there. Go ahead. Um, Larry? Larry. <laughs> uh, yeah. If, uh, Larry and I made uh, Stan, Stan Lee is the most energetic, creative, intense man. When we were doing the show, I was in my early 30s and he was 69. <laughs> now these incredible young people that are doing the new show, which we can't talk about, <laughs> are in their early 30s, and I'm 67. So I, I've been having this strange mirror experience when you ask about the with Stan. Uh, Stan had more confidence in any human being I'd ever met, and he believed he could step into any television show, even if he didn't know who the characters were, even if he didn't know uh, what the plots were, and he could make that a wonderful show. I mean, I see he probably had so many hundreds of different comics dumped in his lap over 40 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. And at the time we were doing the show, Marvel was a small comic book company. They were having financial troubles, whatever. And Stan had been at his height with the comics in the 60s and 70s. And when Marvel came to us to do the show, they said, you've got 30 years of, of X-Men stories behind you, but you have to make it your own show. It's, it's a TV show, animation is different, we understand that, we respect that, so please don't worry about living up to what, they, about mimicking the books or, so we're, to, you know, we're, we're focused on that, we're developing the show. And Stan stepped in and said, after we'd written about eight of the scripts, and said, oh, I think I'd like to change the show all around. <laughs> so to answer your question, Stan would take over any show he could with a lot of things. <laughs> and we just had to have gentle back and forth for about a month to make him realize that the show that he had written in, um, the, in 63, 64 with, with Jack Kirby, the, the books he'd written, that was like a completely different era. It was a bunch of teenagers, uh, almost no women in it. It was it was it was like a different. It was like we said like Pat Boone records and we're and we're doing all, we're doing Nirvana. Our, our, audience, our audience is '90s grunge and you're we're, and the the suggestions are you always are doo -wop. They're wonderful doo -wop, but it just if we try to fit the two together and we sat down with Margaret, we sat down with her boss and just said we need to have one direction and we love Stan. 
And there's a there's an art there's a chapter in one of the books I wrote. It says, "How do you say no to Stan Lee?" <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a ten page chapter. It's a lot. Of it. <laughs> we yeah. The thing is that uh, we had a relationship myself and, and Will Mayo and Rick Hober before where we had done Pride of the X Men, and Stan was the narrator of the show. And so by the time we got this version ready to to roll it, Stan kind of like injected himself into it. We had the experience of, we had a prior experience where he did, he was in charge of the show and he took it over. So with this version, Will got the, <laughs> he got the luck, he, he drew the short straw. And he, he got in there, he got, he, Margaret said, yeah, Stan can't be involved, you will tell him. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's, that's where it happened. Yeah. Am I remembering correctly that, uh, he, he wanted to narrate this series. Oh yes, he, did. Yeah. he, he wanted, wanted to narrate all the seventy-six episodes. Yeah. Well, that turned out to be seventy-six. Episodes. You know, like oh, there's that cute young girl from, you know, yeah. they can't touch people. I wonder what she's up to today. Heads up to reader stories about to use her power. So, so <laughs> for another show that's wonderful for our show, it just would have turned it upside down, and so it it, it, it didn't. It didn't happen. Yeah. All right, we have time for one more quick fan question. Okay. I was there every Saturday morning, uh, big fan. The opening intro theme song is the greatest TV theme song ever. <laughs> so can you talk about, can you talk about how the song, how the intro sequence came to be? Sure, it's, it's real simple. Uh, Ron Wasserman, who wrote it, and didn't get an extra penny for it playing 73 billion times in the last 30 years, but who wrote it and uh, the Power Rangers opening as well. Uh, this guy was pushed by Larry and Will Minio and Sidney to make it more and more intense, more and more intense, more and more intense, because he worked at Savannah. And Savannah usually, you write something, you hand it in, doesn't matter how limp it is, it just goes out. And they would just say, this is not, this is not X-Men yet, this is not intense enough yet. And so he had to, kept adding stuff, and he, he, he rolled his eyes and said, man, I sweated this one. <laughs> but it was Sydney yeah. and Larry and Will pushing him, and on the other side, Larry can talk to it, Larry and Will, over basically a weekend, did the, did the entire credit sequence, drew <coughs> that whole minute, and, yeah. and it, it did one draft, and then it did <laughs> Like we were saying before, we, when, when the show started, we were like three months behind, and so I was given a, ha a weekend. Okay, draw the titles. What? You know. So I, just, <laughs> so I drew almost more, almost two minutes of, of imagery, you know, uh, weaving stuff together. And then when, on Monday, when we came back, and Will and Margaret took a look at it, and said, okay, let's start, you know, we did some small revisions, and most of it remained intact, and then we took something that was like this long, and brought it down to just a minute, minute three seconds. So it was like stream of consciousness, just draw, 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 just put the images down and then, you know, when we, got the, when we finally got the final music that he's talking about, uh, that was like version 15. Yeah. Because uh, he had done, the, I mean, it took music that you would get from Saban, they would just do something and maybe spit it out. And like, okay, here it is, and you'd have to take it like, one, the first and second version, though, we kept sending it back, sending it back, because we knew this is our last chance to do something good, and we weren't going to F it up. So <laughs> send it back, send it back, till we got something that really worked for the show. And I think we could all agree we got that. Yeah. All right, now, can we get anyone who came today in X-Men cosplay to line up right here? We have a few copies of uh, Eric and Julia's book, The Art and Making of X-Men, the Animated Series, to give away. Um, I just want to point out that uh, if you watch the opening credits to X-Men, you've never seen, if you don't know anything about the characters, within one minute, you know who the characters are, and how they fit in this world, and exactly what the show is completely about, within one minute without one word of narration. And it's, if you just look at it by itself, it is a thing that you need. So, Larry, amazing job. We're going to be doing the opening credit sequence for the next series. I'm looking very forward to seeing what you do with the opening credits for that one, too. Wow.